We live in an era of movie going dominated by aggregators and algorithms, where our decision to leave the house to watch a movie might well depend on whether its Rotten Tomato score crosses the precious 60% threshold for a fresh rating. As great as the tomato meter can be for gauging general critical reception to a movie, it certainly isn't the be all and end all. If you relegate yourself to only watching fresh movies, you're going to miss out on some quality cinema indeed. Whilst the following movies may or not be clever or artistically innovative, they're far more entertaining than their brutal 10% or less Rotten Tomato scores would suggest, and absolutely worth your time if you're prepared to approach them with an open mind. I'm Sai for WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 great movies with 10% or less on Rotten Tomatoes. Number 10, A Night at the Roxbury, 9%. It's fair to say that movies adapted from Saturday Night Live sketches don't exactly have a consistent track record, so it was little surprise when A Night at the Roxbury, expanded from the Waferfin Club parody skits of the Roxbury guys, landed just 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yet A Night at the Roxbury endures as something of a cult classic among general audiences, where it rocks a far more appealing approval score of 69%. Nice. Nobody's going to pretend that this movie is high art, but Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan are a lot of fun to watch as lovable idiot brothers Steve and Doug Butabi, who dream of one day owning their own club. The story is thinned out, but makes way for a rat-a-tat blast of oddball humour that's less broad and more agreeably weird than you might expect. Feral and Katan are firmly on the same unhinged wavelength, and it's got a banger of a soundtrack to boot, most crucially reprising Hathaway's iconic What Is Love from the SNL skit. It's no Wayne's World as SNL movies go, but what is? Removed from its critical drubbing upon release, though, it's a great hangout comedy. Number 9, Friday the 13th Part 3, 7%. Rocking a mere 7% on the tomato meter, Friday the 13th Part 3 is the worst reviewed of all the movies in the slasher franchise, though fan reception to the sequel has always been considerably warmer, with many ranking it among their favourite entries in the series. First and foremost, Part 3 is straight up iconic because it's the movie where Jason Voorhees finally gets his hockey mask. Beyond solidifying Jason's look, it also benefits from a tone that never takes itself too seriously. The 3D gimmick is fun for some goofy death scenes, and prankster Shelley remains one of the series' best ever victims. From the entertaining kills to the straight forward story, part 3 is an efficient slasher flick that makes the most of Jason's newly defined look while expertly balancing its scares and laughs. And above all else, it's the only Friday the 13th movie with a disco theme, which alone is enough to earn it a spot on this list. Number 8, Strange Wilderness, 2%. You'd never expect that a comedy starring Steve Zahn, Jonah Hill, Justin Long, Robert Patrick, Jeff Garlin, and Ernest Borgnine would come and go in the blink of an eye, but that's precisely what happened to 2008's Strange Wilderness, which bombed at the box office while scoring just 2% approval from critics. The film follows the crew of the titular nature show as they visit Ecuador in the hope of catching sight of Bigfoot and stopping the show from being cancelled. It's a thin premise on which to hang an R-rated riot of an ensemble comedy that justifies its existence alone for that legendary shark scene and of course the glorious payoff where the team finally encounters Bigfoot. A quintessential stoner comedy if there ever was one, Strange Wilderness is simply too laugh out loud funny to rank among the worst reviewed of Adam Sandler's Happy Madison productions. Number 7, CBGB, 7%. CBGB is a 2013 drama about the legendary former New York City music club of the same name, which was vital in fostering the burgeoning punk movement of the era. Though much has been written about the movie's loose grasp on historical facts, it is at least successful in capturing the mood of its time, which, given the subject matter, is really more important. As CBGB owner Hilary Crystal, Alan Rickman does a lot of the heavy lifting here, but it's really a movie about the music and the resulting vibe. It's an experimental piece of work that pays loving tribute to its period, even if it's fundamentally messy and unvarnished. Cramming so much time and history into a mere 101 minutes is tough, and you can argue a documentary would better serve the material, but as a raw energetic window into a unique period of American pop culture history, it delivers the visceral goods. Number 6, Bulletproof, 8%. Of all the many, many buddy cop movies released in the 1990s, Bulletproof will never top a list of them, but it might shock you to learn that this ludicrously entertaining slice of action comedy fluff has a pitiful 8% on the tomato meter. Bulletproof stars Adam Sandler as a small-time thief being transported across the country to testify against a drug lord by a cop who formerly worked alongside him in an undercover capacity. Plenty of ridiculous hijinks ensue in a movie that is powered by both Sandler and Wayans' robust chemistry and the sheer go-for-broke absurdity of this 84-minute sprint of a genre. Romp. At its worst, it's a sub-lethal weapon exercise, yet benefits enormously from Ernest Dickerson's stylish direction and a fun supporting turn from the late great James Kahn as Kingpin Frank Colton. If you're craving neat action, gut-busting one-liners, and two committed leads, this is a damn fun time. Shakespeare, though, it ain't. Number 5, The Toxic Avenger Part 2, 0%. 
Even if it lacks the immediately giddy freshness of the first Toxic Avenger, does this sequel really deserve a coveted 0% on the tomato meter? Shifting away from the original somewhat grittier tone towards a campier cartoon vibe, the Japan set Toxic Avenger Part 2 nevertheless doesn't leave audiences wanting for creative violence. This is a film that begins with a collection of blind people being killed with an inexplicable level of brutality, before the Toxic Avenger, played by John Altamura, steps in to dismantle the bad guys, whether crushing them to death in a wheelchair, ripping their limbs off, or, get this, compressing them into the shape of a basketball and dunking them in a hoop. Yes. It's definitely a bit too long at 102 minutes, but there's still enough schlocky insanity on offer here for Troma fans to savour. All this in mind though, Troma movies are admittedly relatively critic-proof as cinema goes, so it's tough to take the critical disdain too seriously. Number 4. Almost Heroes. 5%. Now, it's almost impossible to ignore the possibility that Chris Farley fans went a little too easy on Almost Heroes because it was the actor's last starring role prior to his untimely death, but on its own merits, this adventure comedy from the great Christopher Guest just doesn't deserve a brutal 5% tomato meter score. Farley and Matthew Perry star as two hapless explorers who hope to beat Lewis and Clark to making it across America's western frontier in the early 19th century. Bar a few exceptions, western comedies haven't had much success with audiences, and though Almost Heroes was a box office dud upon release, it's built up a healthy head of steam over the last quarter century as a ribald cult fave. Farley is as good as ever, a dynamo of seemingly boundless energy who bounces off of madcap Perry with ferocious gusto. The pairing makes the movie, which despite its slapdash narrative never lingers on a plot point or joke for too long. It may lack the cultural cachet of Farley's Tommy Boy, which with a 41% tomato meter score is also painfully underrated, but is far from the shambolic end to Farley's career that critics suggested at the time. Number 3. Joe Dirt, 9%. While there's a reason that not a single one of David Spade's live-action movies has a critically fresh tomato meter score, Joe Dirt really doesn't deserve to be lumped in with the glut of no-effort comedies lining his filmography. Basically, the Citizen Kane of low-rent, lo-fi white trash comedies, or perhaps the inbred cousin of Forrest Gump, Joe Dirt is a dumb movie that knows precisely how dumb it can be while still keeping the audience's favour. It's not big or clever, but sometimes a stupid comedy created with enthusiasm and conviction just fits the bill. This is a shockingly quotable film from start to finish that finds Spader in his least annoying mode ever, even if the show is categorically stolen by Christopher Walken, who hilariously plays a New York mobster posing as a high school janitor in the Witness Protection Program. Oh yes. One thing's critics protest this one a little too much. It's a silly, deceptively hilarious little comedy with a surprising amount of heart to boot. Number 2. The Cat in the Hat. 10%. It cannot be understated just how much vitriol was directed Mike Myers' way when he starred in this mega-budget adaptation of Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat at the height of his fame and popularity. Landing just 10% approval from critics and receiving a staggering 10 Razzie nominations, it was a public punching bag. And while The Cat in the Hat is admittedly not a good kids' film, enough that Seuss's widow refused any future live-action adaptations of his work, it is a great film for adults. Budgeted at a paint-huffingly insane $109 million, 2003's The Cat in the Hat is basically a work of experimental cinema, Trojan horsed inside a family-friendly tentpole. This is exactly the sort of madcap romp you should expect when you let people who wrote episodes of Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm, and later helmed the sex comedy Eurotrip, make a Dr. Seuss movie. An 82-minute absurdist sprint, the cat in the hat eschews the expected broad humour in favour of more deranged comedic cuts, such as the cat's hat going erect when he stares at a picture of Kelly Preston's character Joan Walden, and Paris Hilton making a most unexpected cameo. Shot with eye-popping flair by legendary Oscar-winning cinematographer Emmanuel Lubezki, and crammed with creative production design like somebody's life depended on it, this is a bold hard swing for the fences. It doesn't always work, but it's tough not to respect the go-for-broke insanity of it all. One suspects it would have gone down better with the more switched-on, media-savvy youth of today. Number 1. Out Cold, 8%. In a just world, Out Cold would have a warm place among the other willfully stupid late 90s and early noughties comedies intended to entertain adolescent boys above all else. Focused on a group of 20-something employees at a ski resort who attempt to stop a wealthy resort tycoon from acquiring the mountain, this couldn't feel much more 2001 if it tried. Led by a solid and enthusiastic ensemble cast, including Jason London, Willie Garson, AJ Cook and Zach Galifianakis, Out Cold has become something of a cult's fave in recent years, occupying a distinct cultural niche as both an of-its-time comedy and a throwback to the ski movies that populated the 90s. And it's a film that deserves to be canonised purely for the legendary sequence involving Galifianakis and a polar bear, the particulars of which shan't be spoiled here, go and watch it. 
Outcold hasn't ever achieved the wider success of other critically maligned comedies of its era, like Not Another Teen Movie, but the 84% audience approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, compared to just 8% from reviewers, surely suggests that time has been rather kind to this cult's gem regardless. And that's the list. Let us know what you thought of this video down in the comments below, and any other movies that you personally enjoyed, despite the fact that they have 10% or less on Rotten Tomatoes. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I've been Cypher Culture, and have a good week.